Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, and welcome to the pod where we chat, argue, and wax poetic about the movies that we love, hate, or that are simply worth talking about. All movies have something to say, and we enjoy trying to analyze what they capture. Welcome to The Shatter After. I am Brandon Alvarado, the Scarlet fan here, joined with the awesome Mike Thomas. And the sleeping godfather himself, Isaac Wolf. What's up, man? Uh, oh, I was muted. <laughs> I was of just course. gonna say. I mean, you could have just gone with you were sleeping. I mean, yeah, but that was I. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. So, going to snore or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a blast, here. guys. It's been a minute since we've had an episode of the Chatter After. So, can't yes. think of a better movie to start off with. Yes. The Shadow After is pretty much that pod where we talk about movies, films, or in general stories that are driven by their artistry, the, the cinematography, vision, directing. There's there's so much things that so many things that we talk about in the Shadow After. And, and and it's all about capturing that moment after we watch a film. We all have that group of friends that we go to the movies with that as soon as we leave the movie theater, whether it's a drama or an action set piece driven film like an MCU film, we leave, we go to that bar, we go to that Burger King or that Wendy's or that Popeye's, and we just eat chicken and talk movies and talk about all the great things that happen to it. Good, bad, the ugly, that's what we do here in The Shatter After. It's been a while since we've done a recording of this show, uh, but we're bringing it back. We're bringing it back strong. And what other movie to bring it back with, like Mike was saying, than The Godfather. The Godfather, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, based on the novel by Mario Puzo from 1969. Nice. Um, it, is this, it is a movie about the microcosm that is the Italian mob in New York City. And what an amazing film, and what a great way to start the conversation, especially when, when it's 50 years old now. Like, it's going to be 50 year old. We're recording this on the 23rd. It's 50 years old as of tomorrow. So we made sure to time it right. <laughs> and, and we just want to talk about what makes this movie tick, what makes this movie interesting, even to us. This movie is older than the people in this pod combined. Well, actually, at least two of them combined. But it's older than us. But it still speaks to a world. I like how this movie, even though it's set in a time stamp place right it's set on a time period it's between 1940s and 1950s where the mob literally ruled everything via court of owls and um come on bro we, we talk on books we gotta put this in. um you brought uh, batman into a godfather conversation it's just hilarious i mean he <laughs> is anti-mafia hero yeah i mean long halloween iconic there you go the batman <laughs> Um, which actually is the most mob. Well, then you have the first part. Of the... Okay, so um, <laughs> I feel Deku. Um, so it is a movie that transcends time. And I think that's what makes it so special. Yeah. Like there's, there's something about the style, the raw and crude um, um, lens through which every scene is shot. It is one of the most quietest movies, but also one of the most intense movies I've seen ever in my life. Um, and there's so much to talk about. Now, we're gonna go, we're gonna go around the table and and share our initial thoughts and experiences with The Godfather. So, Isaac, let's start with you. Well, it was my uh, first watch a couple of weeks ago, and I think uh, this movie is a pretentious piece of donkey turd. Woohoo! We have the raw, powerful take. Of the Sleeping Godfather. Thanks, Isaac, <laughs> for sharing your 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 stance on this film, which is great. It's because not nice everybody has you. not everybody has to like it, which is fine. Um, Mike Thomas. Yeah. So the Godfather is an interesting watch. Um, I I remember watching for the first time, and kind of like Isaac, it it was kind of hard to get through. But like you were mentioning earlier, Brandon, it's a masterpiece of filmmaking like you start noticing different parts of it the second time you go through it right you start noticing that this movie takes place in 1946 because of all the posters in the background advertising movies and shows that happened in that time period or even 
you recognize the artistry in the first few minutes of the film, right? The first opening scene of the movie is a three minute one shot. <laughs> and the artistry in that in that sequence is you see like the the beautiful bright wedding happening and then we go into the godfather's office and we see everything's in shadow everything's grayed out or blacked out and it's like you see the the dichotomy there of the light and the darkness that's with inside of the family and it's moments like that where i can see where isaac would think it's kind of pretentious <laughs> and as family guy put it 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 insists upon itself but there's like just masterful filmmaking here. And it's just really interesting to me how at the time this movie came out, it was supposed to be a box office bomb. It was full of like C-list or unknown actors, which is just laughable when you think of Al Pacino being an unknown actor. <laughs> at that time, right? At that time period, yeah, yeah. 1972. And Francis Ford Coppola came out of a disaster of a release with The Rain People. Exactly. going into this movie so it's like this is the movie that wasn't meant to be good it wasn't meant to be great but it is and and despite isaac's true feelings um which we're not going to agree with but we're going to respect um what i love about uh, when i first saw this movie was a long time ago i was a kid i was probably like 12 14 15 right and and, and the reason i saw this film was because my father, whenever that movie, whenever that movie would come out, whenever that movie was playing, no matter when, whenever that movie was playing, he would stay up all night to watch it. This is the film that no matter what, he would stay up all night watching. Always. He would always oh. stay up all night. Like it could be, he. I know he watched it last night, and it's playing again. And he would stay up all night to watch it. Yeah, it it it, it was a, it was a phenomenon. It was weird. It was stupid. It was crazy. He still owned the films, and he would still do this shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, and then I saw it, and I enjoyed it, and and partly was, of course, you know, when your parents love something, a lot of times it's kind of like, what's the word I'm looking for? A lot of times it's kind of like, um symbiotic right like like you kind of yeah. start loving the things that your parents love just because they're in they're your they're your first access to the world right and then it's almost there, like a part of the family at, at a certain point <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. and then from there you you go into something else and you grow into something else right so the the great thing about it is that in this film um I start gathering respect for it now, especially watching it now. It's probably maybe my ninth time watching it and in, in the in the life that I've lived. And I love the music. The music is great, it's quaint. Um, and also reading the story behind it is that it was supposed to be a bomb. Everybody was worried about it, um, but it was finished ahead of time by this rookie director. But what makes it stand out is no matter how outlandish certain scenes are, is the sensibility to the idea and to the understanding, which I think it's what kind of drives the movie for me, what drives it home, is the fact that this is not meant to be a fantasy film in the right. terms of, do people really live like this? Like, does, that, does this really go on in the background? Is there such a thing as a, consiglieri you know what i mean like like this weird thing right that that interesting enough is the viewpoint of Kay's character when she's seeing and understanding and seeing everything happening in the family and michael kind of explaining oh that's luca brazi he works with my family you know like that whole thing that came yeah. all of the stories unbelievable and outlandish and he does and she doesn't understand why Michael is being very quaint and quiet about it and not that happy about sharing those stories, right? But what I love about it is, is that you are meant to understand that this is how these people live. This is their life. This is how their life worked. This is how their world worked. And for them, that was normal. 
and, and, and the way I love about it the most, and the way you see these little glimpses and and um, and pictures the most, is whenever you see the in betweens of the gang war. The only shots you see, these guys are just eating pasta, eating pasta and salad, playing the piano. It's like you know, it's another day in the office. You know what I mean? Exactly. Everybody in the world is freaking out because they're finding dead bodies, people shot. You know what I'm saying? They don't understand. I mean, of course, the cops are dirty and all that stuff, but we don't talk about that. We're focusing on this little microcosm. And the thing is this, it used to be that way. Yeah. It used to be that way. You know, there's no reason. I mean, there's a reason why Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty, the whole thing about the Patriots was such a fascinating reveal because we know in the deepest corners of our mind there's always someone behind the curtain that's why those stories are so fascinating for any for any age in any time period future or like in the past because we always know there's something beyond ourselves beyond our regular day life and i like the fact that this movie was the first one for one of the first and i'm not saying it's the first gangster movie right I think is it was probably the first one to capture this in such a raw, simplistic, but true way. Definitely. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't like it wasn't like Dick Tracy that it was just making fun of itself. You know, it's yeah. like if you were to find mob mobsters in the funny papers, the funny papers, you would find Dick Tracy, right? This is not what this is trying to do. It's trying to show a vignette or vignettes of what happens in the lives of these people. That's why I think Michael is such a great character, right? Because you, you see him at the start of the movie and then you see him at the end of the movie. And he starts out like, this is not me, Kate. This is my family's business. I'm not a part of it. And then he kind of gets pulled in and then he becomes more hardcore than even the people who were already there. And it's like, you... It's showing you firsthand the descent, right, into that type of life in a very real way. It's not cartoony. Um, no disrespect to the movie Joker, but it's like the the flip there is a little more comic book, right, as opposed yes. to what's yes. happening here. Yes. And so, like, seeing him slowly change over the course of the story is, I think you're right, it's capturing something that feels real. And it yep. doesn't feel like a movie. It feels like we're following him on this journey and we see what he's become towards the end of the film. The film. And the funny thing is that the motivations that Michael has to become the monster that he become, right? Because that's the whole thing. That's like the whole thing about the Godfather trilogy is the tragedy of Michael Corleone. That's really what it is, right? Yeah. So, so, so the whole thing, the whole thing about the tragedy of Michael Corleone is that he was the kid that didn't want to be in the, he didn't, he didn't want to be part of the dirty laundry of his family. He didn't want to make those decisions. He didn't, he wanted to fight for his country. He right. wanted to be the good guy because whether he loves his family or not, you know what I mean? Whether he loves his family or not, he knows that a lot of the things that they're doing is kind of messed up. You know, they're killing people for territory. They're killing people to keep their business interests. They're doing a lot of things that are just not right, you know, at least for normal human beings, right? Yeah, and they don't glamorize it. Like, that's something Correct. that Goodfellas Correct. is, I'd still say, one of my favorite movies, if not my favorite movie of all time. Mm -hmm. And you see Ray Liotta's character, like, idolizing the mob and yeah. all of those people. And it's like, this movie doesn't glamorize. It's just showing you what it was. We're, right. And you come up with your own conclusion by right. the end of it. And I think that's that's why it works. Because every character, like you were saying earlier, they're all three-dimensional. There's no, yep. you know, caricatures really in this film. And so when you're looking at them as real people, you're now invested, even though you know what they're doing is wrong. Like sending a horse head to somebody is terrible and traumatic but you also get why they did it. They had to send a message, right? And it just kind of hooks you. I know it didn't do that for Isaac, but it just kind of grips you at a certain point in the story where you just totally in awe of everything that's happening. And that goes back to 
the cinematography, the score, like everything is just working in unison to create a masterful movie. And I'm going to ask you, Isaac, I want to bring you into this conversation. I mean, I know you're probably asleep over there, but um, it, 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 makes me, it, <laughs> it makes me think. It makes me think. Like, because I, I can understand your turnoff. You know, you're being turned off by the film and by the themes of it. Because one of the things that that the film kind of expects the audience to buy in is that they expect you to sympathize with Michael, right? They right. expect the film expects you to sympathize with the decisions that he's saying that he's taking. Like, because when you think about it, he's not killing um, Salazzo and McCluskey. He's not killing them, right? When he actually pulls those triggers because he has a personal vendetta because they harmed him. He's doing it because he loves his father. You know, that he's doing it because of the family, but not because of the family business. He does it because he loves his family. Right. It, it just so happens that that dark moment, that fine, that that raw decision that he makes, that's the leap where he understands that he kind of gets trapped in that idea that the only way he can love and protect his family is by being part of the business. Is by taking hold of the business, right? That's why he makes a decision with his own hands to put a bullet in his people. But like the movie expects you to sympathize with his decision. You know, the whole thing about when he finds out that his, that's how this can, and I love how that moment went, like they show you how disconnected from the family dealings Michael was, that he yeah. didn't even know that his dad got shot. Yeah, exactly. Like Kay, like Kay finds out through a newspaper. So this is a kid that did not want to get his hands dirty. Like they're shopping for Christmas presents. He's like talking, "Hey, babe, what do you want from you know, you know?" And he's like, and then he sees this and he just loses it. And that's like his driving force, right? Isaac, do you do you feel that the reason you didn't like it is because you couldn't, because you don't you don't agree with the decisions of the characters? Uh, what exactly was that obstacle that you found to actually trying to like this movie? In any way. Well, first and foremost, this movie could have been cut out honestly a half an hour and it, it would be pretty much the same movie. And second of all, you are kind of sort of on point with that because the movie expects me to sort of like feel sorry for him because that he is getting dragged in, but even at the beginning, he's a total douche. It's sort of like, I'm going to be even more con uh, controversial here, but it's sort of like Whiplash with the one that Miles Teller and A.K. Simmons. I can't stand it for similar reason. The main character is a douche. And I can't... I can I, see that. I can. <laughs> I, I just... Sure, A.K. Simmons was an asshole, but... Uh, so was my Miles Heller, and it was like, uh, what is it, pest or cholera, or whatever you're calling the. No, no, but you know what? And I, I want to say something but, worse. But, but, you're but, right. Because J.K. Simmons and Teller, the reason they are against each other towards the end is because they're both dickheads. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's the point of Whiplash. Yeah, I, I don't know yeah. if that really applies here, but I, I get that's a similar yeah. feeling for you. Yeah. 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 But also. Uh, Oh, but also, I can get why he gets a more hardcore when he does the turning point, because, well, uh, as uh, Twisted had sung, he's a war hare. Uh, he's a, sold, a former soldier. They're looking in at him as a war hero. So, yeah, he's, so he's going, seeing everything as war now, essentially. Yeah, so he's mm -hmm. looking in from perspective of war. So, like a PTSD say, rollover? Like yeah. Like he goes from one war to another? Yeah, so I, can, I can see. Of, yeah, I didn't think about that. I can see that. So mm -hmm. it makes sense why he becomes more hardcore than his uh, dad or his brother was because yeah. his background. And but then we also uh, have the likes of uh, it. Just pisses me off. Uh, he makes uh, such a big deal about his girlfriend that uh, wait for me. I'm going to be back for you. Don't worry. And then. Uh, only a one week afterwards, he's forcing a local uh, 
what is it, farmer or something to be able to marry his daughter only for, for then when he comes back. Oh, honey, I need you, blah, blah, blah. And it just... Uh... Well, did you understand his reasoning behind it, though? It just, uh, it, I'm not uh, justifying. I'm not justifying. I'm just asking a question. Because that's a good point of conversation. Go ahead. That's why I'm asking. Please tell me uh, what this was and see if I can, uh, if I understood so, that to myself. So, so you got to think about this. So because of the shot, because he kills Salazo and McCluskey, right? So he has to leave the country because if not, he's going to go to jail. Because yeah. he didn't just kill but, a uh, sleazebag. They said back. that, they, well, they said that he would. But, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine, you're fine, you're fine. He's going to come back at some point. We know that. We just don't know when, right? Because he didn't just kill a sleaze bag of a drug dealer. He also killed a police chief, which even though they're going to do the whole, you know, newspaper or whatever to kind of like this, he's going to destroy the image of the dead to be able to bring Michael back to the living. That's the whole thing, which is just to show you that I think that's the perfect image of showing how much control these families had on the media. And yeah. on society in terms of image, right? Which explains why Victor Corleone was such a close horse and blah, 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 blah. Now, he goes to Sicily to hide. You got to think, this is a guy that literally sacrificed the relationship to the person he cared about because of his family. He's in hiding because of his family. There's no way that he's going to know if he's going to go back. He doesn't know when. He yeah, doesn't. He, he know. could be there for the rest of his life, bro. He, he could be there, there for the rest of his life. He could be there for two days. He doesn't know, right? So he figures, okay, maybe I have to start moving on. That's when he gets with Apollonia and all that happens. Now, when the Tataglia family and Barzini make the attack on Sonny, they end up trying to make an attack on Michael and they kill Apollonia. So now, if, she, if the way he sees life. it, Huh? If he if he truly loved her uh, that he claimed, he could have waited a little bit longer uh, for it to well, be. I mean, he was the... already over there for like a year, right? I think. Yeah, yeah, he was there for a year. But as you got to see, he thought Which he was his not brother gonna... said that uh, he was uh, he probably uh, 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 is only going to be away for a year or so. Which his brother said earlier before well, he, he doesn't, went. But at, but at the same time, he doesn't know. What if Kay had moved on? That's one. But two, here's the other side. And here's where I wanted to go with. After the death of Apollonia, right? Yeah. Love for others ends with Michael. He's not able to love others anymore. Because now all he cares about is my father's, my father's almost got killed. My brother got killed. My family needs me. And that's all my family. That's all that matters. So when he goes to K and says, I need you, he's not talking about love. He's talking about, I need a wife to give me kids to yeah. make my family stronger. And, 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 that's, and that's the whole thing. You're mm -hmm. supposed to feel at this point that Michael is being a douchebag. Because at yeah. this point, he is sacrificing anything that is outside of his family. His family, the family business, all that means it's everything else is collateral damage or means to an end. So that Michael that loved her in the beginning of the movie, that love is no longer there. You understand what I'm saying? That's yeah. why I don't know if you've seen the other films and this does not mean to be a spoiler. I haven't that. seen the other Godfather nor do I have any interest in it at this point. Which is why I'm going to spoil this. <laughs> um, Mike, Mike, you've seen the others, right? Yeah. So that's why towards the the end of act three right and part three you kind of see him reflecting on all the mistakes that he's made and one of the things that he tries to do is build back the original relationship he had with Kay because he understands that this was a movement that truly loved him that gave him kids because she truly loved him and he was just driven by this anger and and lust for power to protect his family because, because by the end of the day this is a movie about family and all these things and why it's a tragedy is because what's fueling his hunger and rage to protect his family is the love that he has but because of the business that his family is intertwined with it's all violence yep 
It's all violence, and there's no other way. If he doesn't respond with the same amount of violence, people die. It's similar to the whole thing that we were talking about in Attack on Titan crossover. Um, of of the you whole can thing. You can salt Attack on Titans and the, comparing it to this. Well, what I'm try, I'm just giving a point. But the whole thing about <laughs> them having to make decisions because of their ideals, right? They're try if they don't make the decision, someone's going to make another decision for their lives. Yeah. So so, but but which is why I I think that the effect that the movie had on you, for those reasons, it means that the movie fulfilled. It's like the yeah, last of us part. Yeah, it's like the last of us part two. You're supposed to hate Abby in the beginning, and then towards the end, you're supposed to still hate her. But then it's not but, that bad. <laughs> but less. And then you start to hate Ellie, and now you're just kind of left like, do I hate everybody? <laughs> that's that's the yeah. plot, right? <laughs> See, <laughs> if you guys are listening, go listen to our episode on The Last of Us, uh, the chatter after. It's in the yeah, we did the we did the first one, we did the first uh, Last of Us, which we have to come back because it's funny because we did the Last of Us episode as preparation for part two, so now yeah. we have to come back and do part two. Which maybe we'll maybe we'll do that before the the show comes out next year. <laughs> hey, okay, but um, does it make sense, Isaac? It's like maybe you hating the film means that the film did what it needed to do. Because you're not supposed to say that these are good people. That's not yeah, the I, point of. I feel like you taking away that everybody in this mob family is a douche was probably the point. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because if you think about it, the people that talk about this film and love the film, they don't say it because they go like, I want my kid to be a masculine child. No, they don't They don't say it because they want to live Luca Brasi. You know what I mean? They, he's the one that says, he, which... No, I'm uh, just thinking that's such a great scene um, because you see, you follow him, the, the death scene, you follow him into the building, and then we're just watching from the window, and the window has all of these fishes decked out, and it's just like, oh, that, that was a great visual cue right there of what's about to happen. Sleeping with the fishes. <laughs> and then the reveal. Right. And then the, and it's not Sonny because Sonny doesn't get it because Sonny's still young. It has to be Clemenza. You know, he is the he is the long running experienced hired gun, right? Yeah. He's um what's the he's the Arthur Morgan, right? <laughs> Clemenza, you know, he was like, that's a code. Look at Brazi sleeps with the fishes, you know. Um, but yeah, everybody that talks about this film, they don't talk about how these guys are role models. They talk about the artistry behind the scenes, like the thought process, like, because something that's very interesting that I was, I was reading, I was catching up on <coughs> Wikipedia and, um, and, and one of the interesting things that I found, which I find very particular is that. Francis Ford Coppola didn't like Mario Puzo's Godfather. Yeah. Like, he found it very sensationalist and very, like, propaganda. And he just took the elements that work from the story. Because when you watch The Godfather, it doesn't feel sensationalist. It feels yeah. raw. It feels stern. Like, there's no laughter be, in this film. Yeah. Like, even, even, even the only laughter you see is in the wedding celebration. But then again, it's a wedding. Like, everything else is a quiet conversation. Serious. Direct. And it's all about, it's a movie about conversations. About moments. And yes, there's moments of levity. But the moments of levity are within the carnage. Which is, I think that's the brilliance of it. Of yeah. course, some of the most famous scenes in movie history came out of moments of where people got shot. <laughs> like, for example, you got the whole thing with Luca Brasi. Everybody knows, leave the gun, take the cannoli. Yeah. Which is built by the fact that the wife is saying, don't forget the cannoli. <laughs> Again, family people. <laughs> I feel like that's that's another thing, though, that makes this movie work, is that it's it's brutal, it's violent, but the violence is in service of the story. Sometimes in films, and I'll just use this example because it's the most basic of comparisons of, take a Marvel movie, right? Take right. an Avengers movie. They, you need the Avengers to punch something. 
So in the first Avengers film, we have them punch each other because Loki's army isn't here yet. <laughs> yes. And so it's like we have to come up with reasons to have action take yes. place because that's what the audience is here to see. Yes. Whereas in the Godfather, the way that they use it, it's it's intense and you never really want action in the Godfather. Because once yeah. the tension starts rising, you're like, oh gosh, who's about to die? What's about to happen? And so I feel like the use of violence in this film, and that's what I love about storytelling. Like in a John Wick movie, John Wick is killing people every five minutes, probably 20 people every five minutes of that movie. We need so kind of become, extras. <laughs> right. You kind of become numb to it. Whereas here, it reminds you guns are dangerous. Yes. And some action films make you forget that. And so that's, again, showing how real they approach the story of, yeah, somebody getting shot, it's not fun. (laughs) It's not the Marvel movies that you're used to. And no shade to those. I love those films. It's just a different type of storytelling. Right. Action has a different purpose. Exactly. And, and And I love how you say that, that violence pushes the story forward. And, like, every major character arc shift, which I'm very is 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 driven by a violent moment yeah. like michael carleone's arc or descent into i think that's the, the best way his descension to godfather dumb right because not an ascension exactly. his ascension into godfather dumb because that's the way it's you know the tragedy of michael carleone his first shift occurs when vito gets shot right they miss they don't kill him, but he gets shot. Then the next act of violence that drives everything is when he kills Solazzo and McClutsky. That's another shift. By the time he's in Sicily, you can see he has a completely different demeanor. You know what I mean? That's why and- when we shift to Sicily, it's such... I wouldn't say it's a shock, but you can tell that that's when the movie, the tone changes because right. Michael himself is also changed at that point. Right. And, and and because now he's no longer Mike the war hero. Right. He's Mike the hitman. And and Mike the hitman at the same time thinks, okay, I did what ne- I did what needed to be done. My family's okay now. Because you got to understand, that's what he's thinking. He's thinking Tom is handling everything. Sonny's Sonny Dad is back home, probably trying to get better, right? My family has this under control. I did what needed to be done. If I need to stay in Sicily for the rest of my life, my family should be okay. But no, Don Tomazino comes over. Bad news in America. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. another act of violence. Sonny gets killed. Apollonia blows up. Another act of violence. Yep. Mike shifts again. Is no longer enough that I was Mike the hitman. Sonny's no longer around. Dad is old. Tom is not Italian. I got no choice. Because if I don't, because Fredo's not going to, you know, Fredo's not going to do it. Yeah. I'm the only one that can do this. So he takes hold of the family. So now it's Mike, the guy, Mike, the leader. He's not a godfather yet, which, by the way, is very interesting because he's not a godfather till the end of the film. Yeah. And then the final act of violence in the film is all the straight, all the string of murders after Vito's death that all occur as Michael is becoming godfather to Connie's child. Yep. That's when he's sealed as the godfather, Michael Corleone. Which, which again, every act of violence is is moving something forward, is rectifying something, and that's the brilliance of the film, and that's that's how you know that it's artistry because everything that happens, every every everything, every drop of blood that's dropped is because it's servicing a narrative, which that's the smart thing about it. Because right. every other gangster film, because you got to think about it, nobody goes to Scarface solely because of the drama, right? People go to Scarface because it's outlandish. 
because yeah. it's driven by this over the top things. Which, by the way, I can see a Tony Montana type do all that thing and being so cooked up that he won't die from the first shot. You know what I mean? I can see that. <laughs> But that's why people go to see Scarface. That's why right. people say he's a badass because he'll kill whoever stands in his way, period. You know what I mean? That's why people go see Scarface. That's not why people go see The Godfather. People go see The Godfather because it is this, it is the tragedy of the fallen hero. But, but in a story where the, the story requires the hero to fall into this. For sure. You know, and it's and, and I also love how the it, it's it's all about Vito's biggest failure, right? The fact that he couldn't save his son Michael from the world, from this world. He couldn't save his son Michael from his own family. Which yeah. it's 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 fucking dramatic. Yeah, it's it's fantastic, and that's but that's why this film, fifty years later. Is still worth talking about because again, like that's what we're doing this. Right? We're doing it because of its 50th anniversary, mm -hmm. and this is your. You said like about your ninth time watching it, and you're still finding things, yeah, in this story, yeah, to this day, which is just unbelievable. It's that's why I love movies, man. <laughs> right yeah. there, yeah. For for moment for all the little moments for all the, the storylines, and like it's it's interesting that we're saying that it's 50 years old, right? It makes me think. You could even say this is one of North America's legends now. It's the myth of the Godfather. You know what I mean? Not that every yeah. not that every gangster movie is the Godfather, but there's no way, there's no way, there's no way that every gangster movie after Godfather didn't take notes from it. There there is a there is a genre. That was born out of this film. Because Not just gangster movies, just movies in general, too, right? Too like every director is saying, ah, oh, I'm pulling this from The Godfather, lighting, dialogue, cinematography, score. Every aspect of this film has inspired filmmakers for generations now, which is just wild. It's great. Yeah. It's great. It's great. It's, 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 is it one of my favorite movies of all time? No, because I'm a simpler man. <laughs> but but I do see there's there's magic here. There's 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 creative power at work. And I think that's what that's what the best films have. Creative power at work. And like it might sound stupid, but just like you said with the fishes in the in the in the background and stuff like that with the Cabrazi, we're talking about that in The Godfather. But a lot of people don't realize that's the fun little stuff that we as comic book nerds love because when we watch a comic book movie and we see the little hints here and there that build the narrative in the background or on the side those are the things that drive that, that grind our gears in the good way because wow they thought about this and that's what i love about the godfather there's no, nothing in this in the screen is an afterthought nothing right. and that's what we're still talking about today exactly Sure. Isaac, anything else to add? I really don't know. <laughs> so are you coming back when we do Godfather Part 2? Because in hey. two years, because in no. two years, it will be the 50th anniversary of that one. No. No. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> hey, I appreciate you sleeping through this one. So, Mike. Final thoughts. Um, final thoughts on The Godfather Part 1. It is a movie that changed cinema as we know it. It's like, I'm with you where it's like, it's not a movie I'm not going, I'm going to revisit very often, but yeah. I can definitely respect all the hard work and artistry that we found in this film. Um, just like you were mentioning before, like the little nuances, like when, I believe it's the scene where Michael finds out what happened to his father and he like goes in the phone booth and he boxes Kay out. It's the exact same thing that happens at the end of the movie where he yep. is now the godfather and she's off in the distance and she's again boxed and, out. And the final scene is the door shutting 
not on Michael's face. The door shutting on Kay's face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's like it's it's set up and payoff. Like you were saying, it's yep. kind of reminiscent of a comic book movie and Easter yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's I don't know, man. It's just such a beautifully well thought out movie that I have to respect it for that. Even if again, it's not one I'm going to have on in the background <laughs> yeah. very often because it's very intense, but. I just really, I'm glad we did this for the 50th anniversary, being able to go back and watch something and see how it's still relevant to filmmaking to this day. It's not, like some movies are dated. Like I love It's a Wonderful Life, but that movie's very dated. (laughs) The Godfather, it's timeless. And that's, like you said, at the top of the episode, it's a period piece. It was made in the 70s, It's set in the 40s. Therefore, it exists in its own kind of, era of filmmaking that's still being felt to this day and it's funny because the the hd remaster of the movie makes everything a lot cleaner so the yeah. immersion is still fresh yeah. every time you pull it on like it still draws you in and and you do and you literally get transported so you got to think imagine the people back in the 70s when they watched this how they were transported i mean this is a film that was made with a budget of what Forty thousand, forty million dollars. It made two hundred and ninety dollars in the a million dollars in the box office. Like it almost what quadrupled his budget. It's crazy because people were because there's an immersion power there because of the artistry. Um, but like you were saying, um, it is a timeless masterpiece of a film. Um, it is one of the best films of all time. Not one of my tops because I have different different preferences but it's one of my favorite films when it comes to what the potential of sin of, of cinema as an art form like if this is the kind of film that you like check mark like cinema as an art form to godfather you know what i mean like that's like one of those that's there um and it's funny because it falls for me in the same category as the original alien and, and the reason I, I put them in the same boat is because I hate horror movies. Um, excuse my language. I'm a little bitch. I get scared. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I'm not huge on horror movies, but the artistry and thought process behind those scenes of that film, yeah. like Alien is a brilliantly shot film. All the thoughts, all the shots, even with the low, like everything is like a low budget design, like, We've seen better xenomorphs now than we did before, yes. But none of the newer Alien movies like Prometheus can touch the original Alien. And me, I'm not an Alien fan, but the art is there. Alien is another one of those films that cinema is art, you know? And that's what Godfather is. If If I wanna brush up on what the power of cinema has, I go see The Godfather. So guys, thank you for joining us for the Shatter After episode four, um, Godfather's 50th anniversary. Um, let us know your thoughts. Do you like the Godfather? Did you sleep on it like Isaac? Were you irritated on it like Isaac? Do you do you see, do you love the lines? What's your favorite line of the movie? Mine, personally, is when, is when, is when Vito tells Sonny, oh, I want to ask you, Mike, I want to end there. When Vito says to Sonny, when they're having that meeting with Salazzo, and Vito says, don't ever tell someone outside of the family what you think. Which to me is like, that works for so many things in life. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite line, Mike? It's not personal, Sonny. It's strictly business. That I feel like encapul- encapsulates everything that's going on with Michael's character, right? That is showing how his worldview is starting to change of where he's yeah. he's becoming colder. Yeah. And so I feel like that line is everything you need to know about that character. And moving especially forward. if you yeah moving forward. Yeah because that occurs when they're planning the hit, right? Right. Yeah. So that's that's my favorite line and that's probably my favorite scene of the movie too because like the camera's zooming in and you can start to feel like you can feel he becomes the main character now from that camera zoom. Yeah, so good. Isaac, do you have a favorite line or a line that you hated the most? <laughs> I can't recall, honestly. And this is not me uh, being a 
something. If it, uh, well, if maybe uh, was uh, look how they massacre my boy, but uh, just because of all the memes. You come to me on the day of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> not as a, not as my friend, but with disrespect. Mm-hmm. Either that or that shot when he's kicking John Fontaine's ass for, to be a man. Priceless. Yeah. Come with so this. <laughs> so great. So, this ends the episode of The Shatter After on The Godfather. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We had a blast here. Um, this episode goes live on the Novice Cinephile Network. I don't know if it's called that, but I'm going to call it that. And it goes live on our podcast channel very soon. So go check it out and check out our library of other Shadow After episodes. We covered the Joker. We, well, correction. We covered Joker. Joker. We covered Sonic the Hedgehog, which the second one's coming up and it looks pretty fun. And we covered The Last of Us. It is a video game. It is not a movie, but there hasn't been a cinematic experience so powerful as The Last of Us. As that it's a perfect game. story. It is. <laughs> it is. So... Stay tuned for more episodes. This will be happening once a month, twice a month, um, depending on the material that we find that interesting to cover. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Mike Thomas, where can we find you, my brother? Well, if you're watching on YouTube, you can find me here at Novice Cinephile on <laughs> YouTube. You can find me at Novice Cinephile on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook. Um, the Amateur Otaku, the podcast with these guys talking all things anime. So that's fun. Um, I know Isaac and I are doing My Hero Academia and My Hero Academia Vigilantes, and we're still doing Attack on Titan. Um, I don't know when you guys are listening to this episode. The show might be over. The show might, for some reason, still be going on. We'll find out in the future. We'll find out in two weeks. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. But yeah, you can just find me everywhere. Novice Cinephile, talking movies, TV, video games, and the such. Awesome. Isaac, where can we find you, brother? Well, you can find me at, uh, well, at the Amateur Talker talking uh, manga and anime. And you can find me at uh, Emblemaniac on Twitter. And you can find the Amateur Taku at Amateur Taku Pod on Twitter. You can find me at the Scarlet Fan 52 on Twitter, the Scarlet Fan 52 on Instagram, and the Scarlet Fan 52 on TikTok. I have no idea why I'm there, but that's where I at. We'll see you next time, guys. Have it awesome and keep enjoying movies. Peace. Peace. Hey,